In this video, we're gonna install over 700 pounds of acoustic treatment in a Trinov digital room corrector and see which one makes a bigger difference and see just how good we can get my new studio to sound. All right, so I mean, I'm obviously sitting in the room totally done, but we need to jump back in time and get measurements from before any of this happened. I wanna know what the before is for what we're gonna be doing here. My plan right now is basically to just use the Trinov microphone that will give me a graph showing me exactly like the before all of the correction that it does before and after the acoustic treatment and a program called Rue or R-E-W, I'm not quite sure, but it'll give more advanced graphs that should give us more information. Here's just a quick time lapse of the panels in general being installed. Uh, if you wanna see more content like this, I just posted a video going through the entire studio start to finish, and it gives more information about why I specifically went with these panels, my decision on placement, all of that. If you're interested in seeing that video, I'll have it posted at the end of the video as well as a link in the video description. And traveling back to the present, I now need to actually take measurements in the room with all the panels up and everything set properly, figure out how big of a difference we've actually made. All right, so let's take a look at what actually happened here. So this is the before. So as you can see here, we've got some really big, weird things happening. So this left speaker is getting down to like a 13 dB cut at somewhere around like 85, and the right speaker is you know, still doing like 6 dB cuts there. They've got big boosts down at like 40. It's not terrible, uh, you know, up above 150 or so, um, but the low end is clearly just wrong. So if we go now to after the acoustic treatment, interesting. So it definitely made a big difference, especially in the low end. So, I mean, that, that left speaker is now at like a, five or six dB cut instead of a 13. So it cut that in half, huge deal. Um, the right speaker is much more normal. Um, there's still some pretty big swings, although, you know, we are talking about probably four dB differences here, which is, you know, noticeable and definitely a thing, um, but substantially better, at least in the low end. Um, the speakers were moved slightly in um, and forward a little bit, so the positioning isn't exactly the same. I'm guessing that um, this being shifted over had a lot to do with just placement more than anything else. I think that is just placement in the room. Um, but it is a smaller boost, and it, in general, I would prefer to be on this one. This one is the, you know, the one with the treatment in the room. We also can see through this, we can look here and it says RT60. So that is just a general measurement used by the industry to give an average number um, for how long it takes for the sound coming out of the speaker to die off in the room. And before we had any treatment, we were sitting there at around 0.5. Now, if we go to after the treatment, we are, so there's more speakers there because I just did this with a full Atmos setup instead of just the two speakers, but we're down to 0.26. And generally speaking, for studios of this size, you want your RT60 to be between 0.2 and 0.3. So we are right in the sweet spot right there. Now let's jump over to that REW RU program. Uh, there's, some, there's a couple different things we can look at there that I think tell a much more holistic picture of what's happening in the room now. So this is the uh, spectrogram of before any of the treatment. So you can see Basically, my, my rough understanding of how this works is the audio starts here at the bottom, stops at some point, and then however far up it goes is how long it's decaying for. So you can see a lot of these frequencies from probably like five, 600 to five or 6K are getting up to somewhere around that like 350 to 400 line where they're taking that long to start to fall off. And then you can see there's really three big spikes down low um, that are reaching that 400 mark. So 
that's our before. And then if we go to our after, much nicer. So you see basically from, you know, 75 Hertz up, we are really consistent across the board at around that 200 mark. So that is awesome to see. Uh, we did interestingly lose this third one. So this third like 120 bump, we were able to capture. So the acoustic treatment did a great job with that. I tried to get as thick of stuff as I possibly could and it worked getting that frequency down. Um, however, the two lower boosts, the two lower um, nodes, if you will, um, are still there though. And, and that's just because, man, those, those really low frequencies are so hard to absorb. When you look at the physics of it, just the actual wavelength of a, you know, 57 and, you know, 39 hertz frequency are huge. And you just have to have, I mean, I've heard people say something like you need four feet deep of foam to really fully absorb those frequencies. The rest of the room, you know, from again, 75 up is really consistent, which is awesome. All right, so let's also take a look at this waterfall. So let's go back to the, the no treatment version. And here is a waterfall graph. So this is basically a 3D chart. You can kind of see like the depth of it. And basically my understanding is that the closer that the lines get to you, the longer they are lasting. So you basically don't want them to get close to you. Um, if you notice, in general, this front section is pretty consistent until we get to this like 700 to 110 range, somewhere in there. And then it's like, it's literally off the charts. I mean, it's just resonating in here like crazy and just basically taking off and just won't stop. Um, if we go down further, there's still a few, but it's, it's, it's less bad than kind of this mid range area, which is where a lot of rooms resonate. So that makes sense. Now, if we go to with the treatment, way better. So well, this whole area is really quite consistent. Um, there is a little bit of an area here that has a bit of a dip, which is fine. And then there's this weird line at like 277, which seems to indicate that like, something just resonates forever in here at that frequency. I'm almost wondering if that's like something that happened to be resonating in the house at that time. Like if there was like the furnace was on or I don't really know. Um, it could be like the fan or something of some piece of equipment I've added. I, I really don't understand what that is. Um, but in general, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, as you can see down low though, it still has some, some issues because again, I don't have perfect acoustic treatment all the way down in here. Realistically, in order to get the really low end stuff, like we're talking 100 hertz down to be correct in this room with the shape of it and just like the physical constraints of what I'm dealing with here, I'm gonna need something a little different. And I'm thinking someday, they're very expensive, so we'll see. But there is this thing called the AVA, I think, C20 analog active bass trap and this thing apparently does just magic for low end so i've never used it this isn't sponsored in any way shape or form <laughs> i would love if it were if yeah, if anyone knows how to get me one of these please um, but basically it's a box that kind of looks like a speaker you put it in the corner you plug it in you're done and they say it absorbs like they basically say it acts like it's 25 times the size of the physical box of acoustic treatment, it basically sounds like magic, but from all the research I've done, it seems to just work and would allow me to have actually correct low end in a room like this, which seems crazy. So maybe one day, but for now, I think we'll manage. All right, so we've kind of talked over what the natural frequency response of the speakers is coming at me with and without the acoustic treatment. And then we've talked about how the room resonates. So, you know, we, we see this, this spectrogram here of how the room resonates and basically from 60, basically 70 Hertz up, we're rock solid. And down below, you know, it's not ideal, but it's not horrible. So 
Now we just need to really correct what's coming out of the speakers and that is where the magic of the turn off happens. So if we go back over to the images from the turn off, here is a kind of zoomed in uh, version of what we're getting from the speakers right now before any correction. And this is zoomed into 10 dB. The last ones were 20 just because it's less than 10 dB of issues. Um, now, if we look at that, that is the before with all of the chaos of every single speaker in this room. That is the Atmos chaos that should be happening in this room without any correction to it. This, this image right here is how I don't understand how people feel comfortable mixing an Atmos without a trend off, honestly. Like, I understand my treatment isn't perfect, but it's not terrible. And that looks like spaghetti garbage. Like, how could you possibly expect to mix with that much variation across different speakers and everything? Seems insane to me. That is what the Trenov did. So that is flat. So I'm putting a bit of a curve on it to make it more pleasant to listen to, which ends up looking a bit like that. But just look at how flat that is. That is what the Trenov was able to correct for and make work across all of these different speakers. I mean, we are looking at, at most a 2 dB in either direction variation, which realistically is fine. Like, I can work with that. We were looking at that. I mean, we're, we're talking the dips are down to negative 10 and there's like in between different, the same frequency area in different speakers, we have we have like a 15 dB difference. So you could hear things completely differently if you placed it there versus there or something. Like, I'm so happy with this. Of course, just the left and the right speakers also fall within that line. Like they are within a dB or two of dead flat across the board or exactly the curve that I put them on, but infinitely more useful. So I have this essentially perfectly flat line that I'm hearing out of them. So that is what it's hitting right here. So as long as if I move, you know, if I move, it'll shift a little bit. Um, but as long as I stay in my mix position, which this is my mix position, I don't really move from here. It's going to sound perfectly flat coming at me. I know from 75 Hertz up, it's resonating evenly through the room. And then I just kind of have to pay a little bit of attention to the real low end stuff and kind of double check that, which is fine. I can work with that. Another thing that the Trinov is able to do that I just wouldn't even know how to work in Atmos without is align the phase of all the speakers. So if you're moving things around between speakers and they're coming out of multiple speakers at once, like in headphones, it's obviously fine. And most people are listening to Atmos in headphones right now. So honestly, like, I don't really have a problem placing things and having them coming through multiple speakers at the same time because in any proper setup, that should be completely fine. But in a non-proper setup, that would be, it sounds so weird. So anyway, look at the before phase lines of all the different speakers and then look at what it did for after. Everything is so much more in line. I am not gonna get cancellation on things all over the place it makes mixing in Atmos make sense. I've only done one mix in Atmos so far. I've just had the room a very short amount of time. And I listen to it in headphones and I'm beyond shocked to be able to say this, but it translated to headphones first try. Like there were a couple minor tweaks that I had to make, but like it just works. It's incredible. I'm so happy with what this Trinov is able to do. And so there's, there's trade-offs, man, between what the digital correction is there for and needed to do and what the acoustic treatment can only just do through physics. So here's probably your question. Which one is more important? What would I pick if I could only have one? Really difficult question. Um, it probably would have to be the acoustic treatment if it were just gonna be one. The reason for that is with the how this whole studio building process went, I actually ended up receiving the Trenov first. And so I had it in the room without the acoustic treatment, had it do its whole tuning process, tried to mix a song, and it was really hard. Like it, 
it wasn't right at all. Like the high end was just weird. I felt like I couldn't push any high end when I, I knew like I could tell it needed to be brighter, but I couldn't make myself do it because the room just re reflected the brightness back at me and it felt wrong. So you can't just get the trend off, make it give you a flat line and expect it to work. It's, it, it will not work. I would probably make a similar argument to you can't just put acoustic panels everywhere and expect it to just sound perfect. Now, there are cheaper alternatives to the Trenov. You can do things like sound ID or even manually tuning by ear I've had some mild success with in the past. You can't just cheap your way into sound panels. It's absorption. It just is what it is. So I would say if I had to pick one, it would be treatment. Um, but if I'm doing professional work, I'm going to look really hard at the trend off because you need to be able to hear reference. All right. So graphs and panels and processing, they're all cool. They matter. And it's very interesting, but why is this whole thing important in the first place? Why can't I just basically mix in this room with the, just the speakers I have and, you know, just kind of get used to how they sound in here and everything will be fine. Right? In general, Technically, yes, kind of, but it's a lot harder to do it that way. And I'm really trying to build this room for efficiency. I want to be able to mix in a straight line to my goal. See, this room in general is purpose built. And the purpose of this room is to just be able to mix. I don't want to have to overthink when I'm in this room. I just want to know that if I mix it in here and it sounds good, it'll sound good everywhere else. Because I have to create content in here that'll be consumed on a phone speaker, in a car, in a bunch of different cars. Some cars have really awesome stereo systems. Some cars have overdone stereo systems. Some are like pretty weak sounding. Uh, I need to be able to have a laptop, just be sitting on someone's lap and have it sound good. In headphones, through normal speakers, there's so many different ways that people consume content. And if the room isn't giving me an accurate response of what I'm actually sending out, how am I ever possibly supposed to expect to succeed in all those different areas? I mean, like, look, you guys saw those graphs. I have tons of acoustic treatment in this room and it's nowhere near flat in here. Just objectively, it's true. It's not that close to flat. And if I am experiencing that, how could I possibly expect anyone else to have a better listening environment for their car or something? It just seems pretty unlikely. Now, when you're just consuming, doesn't really matter. You do kind of just get used to the way it sounds and who cares if there's not very much, you know, 75 Hertz in whatever your living room, you know, if you're watching TV or something, you're not really going to be too upset about it. But if I have a big dip in 75 Hertz in here and I'm really focusing on how everything sounds, I may put a big boost there and then in a different sized room that has their dip at like, you know, 90 hertz or some other frequency, there's going to be this huge boost somewhere that's going to make it just sound wrong. So because of that, I really want this room to be as flat as possible. A minor exception to that being the general like bass boost I have on the end of the frequency graph that I put there. It's just because I enjoy listening with more low end. And if I don't do that, just based on my like enjoyment of how I listen to music, I'm going to put too much bass in there. Again, I'm trying to set this up so that I don't have to think. It's just what sounds best to me, make that move and have it work everywhere else. So for me, I needed to put a little extra bass in this room. Some other people might not feel that way. Same with the high end. I left the really high end stuff boost there that these speakers naturally have because I like it. I think it sounds nice and I don't want to overly brighten the super high end, especially because I know that the like bright high end is a preference. Some people don't want that. And so I want people to be able to pick their speakers and headphones and all that based on what they like listening to and have my mix kind of convert to their style that they've chosen with, with whatever device they're using to listen on. Having this room flat also allows me to just work faster. I don't have to second guess things. I know I'm hearing everything. I can just confidently make decisions and move on instead of guessing and trying to think like, okay, I know I liked how that felt there, but considering how this room works, I don't want any of that. I just want to work and then be done. 
I'm also realizing I can learn so much faster in this room because if I try a technique, I'll know immediately what it's doing because I can actually hear all the details of what's happening. So I can see, is that making it better? Is that making it worse? What did it do? Look, I hate that this is a thing, especially as someone who came from the front of house live world. Like for the most part with that, like if it sounds good, it sounds good. End of conversation, you're done. It sounded good. But I just kept running into this issue where I would try to mix in headphones or mix in like a random studio that someone kind of threw together that doesn't have acoustic treatment well set up and everything. And I would just like, it would sound so good in that room in space. And I would be like, yeah, this sounds awesome. And then I'd go listen in my car and just be like, am I terrible at my job? What's happening? Some of that is you learning techniques over time and just getting better. But a huge part of that is no, I was making good decisions for that specific room that I was in, but they just weren't reality-based decisions. Like the only reason why that decision was the right decision was for that room. And if you're making decisions like that, it's just not going to translate well to everyone. Now, I totally understand that not everyone can spend a bunch of money on acoustic treatment and a big fancy DSP box and have a dedicated space for mixing. So because of how frustrating this has been for me over the years, I've learned a couple of different skills and tools that I can use to kind of combat this whole thing. If you're interested in learning about that, I made a video a little while ago that you can go watch. Um, it has a couple tips that I think would be really useful, especially the second one that has saved me time and time again when I'm listening in bad environments. That video should pop up right here, but if it doesn't, there'll be a link down in the description. If you're more interested in the video about how I built this whole room, the video should also pop up right there. And if it doesn't, again, link in the description. I hope this video was interesting and maybe a little bit useful for you. Uh, if you aren't already, don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. See ya.